Okay, Matt Roscoe here at the University of Montana. Our content uh, lecture, I guess, this week for uh, Math 595.50, Teaching Geometry from a Problem-Solving Perspective. Wanted to say just a quick word about uh, the choice of, uh, you know, when I was laying out the course, I thought, well, how am I going to make the uh, content conversation, I guess, align with the pedagogical conversation for the week? So I did want to uh, sort of just say a word about that because in the pedagogical conversations, we're, we're talking about uh, measurement, and in the content aspect, we're talking about analytic geometry, which, which might at first glance seem like an unusual pairing. But um, I would like to just say that you know this is actually they are quite close uh, in terms of concept. Um, you know, in geometry, we think of um, synthetic geometry as sort of being somewhat free from measurement and free from, from, from points and, uh, and the coordinate plane. Whereas in analytic geometry, when we impose uh, the geometry on the co coordinate plane, we really are sort of creating what we would think of as a metric space or, or a place where things can be measured. We won't do a lot of that um, in the content exercises or in this lecture in terms of measuring lengths or, uh, or talking about areas or volumes. But, um, but I do want to just draw your attention to the fact that analytic geometry is, is a close cousin, let's say, of measurement because both are um, settings in geometry where there is some unit defined and that unit is used uh, to measure or to plot or to uh, um, draw shapes on. So we'll uh, redefine analytic geometry, then I want to go through two just basic concepts in analytic geometry, the distance formula and slope, say a bit about each, and then get into some examples which will be similar to those um, content exercises for the week. So an analytic geometry we call, sometimes called Cartesian geometry or coordinate geometry, is the study of shape drawn on a coordinate system. It's given Cartesian geometry name because it was, you know, the, the, the Cartesian plane or the coordinate plane was was first uh, introduced to the world uh, from by the uh, mathematician and philosopher Descartes. The distance formula, um, one of the basic ideas on the coordinate plane that we teach uh, usually in eighth grade after the Pythagorean theorem has been introduced is this. If we have A as uh, a point x1, comma y1 and B as a point x2, y2 on the coordinate plane, then the distance AB is given by the square root of the difference x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Of course, students always ask as a matter which point I assign to uh, x1 or, and uh, y1, x2, y2, and your answer is always no, it doesn't matter, and then the questions are why. Um, and the reason is, of course, because when we take a difference and square it, what we're really doing is, is we're, we're finding the absolute value uh, of the difference. Uh, so one way you could introduce it is to say, well, it doesn't really matter because really that parentheses um, could be just an absolute value. Um, another way of thinking of it is just to say, well, it's, it's the difference in the x's and the difference in the y's taken in any order uh, squared um, because those differences are either positive or negative, uh, but the same um, positive or negative, uh, um, but the same absolute value, uh, then we could think of it this way. Of course, this all gets back to where the formula comes from, of course, which is just the Pythagorean theorem. Um, this is usually where I start with on the for form formula when I derive it. I say, well, what can we say about this little triangle um, that we draw where the horizontal component um, moving from A to B is delta X and the vertical component moving from A to B is delta Y. Um, and of course, students usually, if they remember Pythagoras, which they tend to remember, um, They'll tell me that AB squared is equal to the change in X squared times the uh, plus the change in Y squared. So AB being the hypotenuse then of the triangle. So hopefully you've had some familiarity with this formula um, and we'll use it in our, our exercises here this week. Another important um, concept that arises on the coordinate plane is that now lines can be given a measure of slope. There's some orientation, let's say, to the steepness of lines. And of course, this is something that makes the coordinate plane um, very useful and um, is, is you know, a foundational topic introduced in middle school that, that probably threads through all of the rest of their study right up through calculus. So one of the most important, uh, I guess, concepts probably in all of K8 mathematics is this concept of slope. 
uh, we define it uh, as such if we have a point A and B uh, given x1, y1, x2, y2, then the slope of the line is defined as the rise of the, the line over its over the run of the line, uh, so change in y over change in x. That would be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, um, and, uh, and that's slope. Uh, some <coughs> implications of measuring slope as we do are that horizontal lines have a slope equal to zero, uh, why does that happen? Well, if a horizontal, if a line is horizontal, then the change in y is zero uh, over some finite change in x. So we have zero over a number, and that's always zero. Vertical lines have a slope that's undefined. Why does that happen? Well, if um, if you're vertical line, then you have, um, you know, as much rise as you want, um, but but no run ever, right? So you get something, uh, um, a number here over zero. Uh, as the line approaches vertical, its slope approaches infinity. Well, why does that happen? Um, as, an, as a line approaches vertical, we have large rises over very small runs. So, and, and as we get steeper and steeper, we can make that rise as high as we want it, um, and, and, and the run as small as we want it. And so we get um, a, a number that's approaching either positive or negative infinity, I should say as well, depending on from which direction we're approaching vertical. Um, and uh, two lines with slopes that are negative reciprocals are perpendicular. This is a really important uh, concept usually taught um, in eighth grade and again in Algebra 1. Um, I'd like to show you my, the way that I usually justify this. I think it's kind of a fun way to think about it. Well, if you have some line, I don't even draw it on, on a coordinate plane. Um, what I have here are two cutout um, square uh, overheads. I don't know if you can really see that in the video. But let's say you have some line with some positive slope, A over B, and the question is, what's the slope of the line that's perpendicular to A over B? Well, you can kind of easily think of what to do this. See, I have two of these on top of each other. Since they are square, I've cut them to be square. I can just rotate this um, by 90 degrees, and I, I get that picture. And, um, and now I think it's fairly easy to see what's going on. Uh, the green line has... Uh, see if I can do this without moving it. This one has slope, um, uh, rise of A, run of B, so it's just A over B. Um, and the blue line, now you can see, has slope. Well, the rise is now, I guess, it's going down, right? Um, so so we're, we're running horizontally in a positive sense, but going down. So the blue line has slope. Um, so the rise would be going down B, but the run is a positive A. So if we kind of think of it like this directionally, um, and think of it like this directionally. And I think that's a pretty good uh, um, dynamic way for students to see why that happens. I mean, all we're doing is rotating the paper by 90 degrees. Um, so what does it do? It, it takes what used to be the vertical component, it rotates it and makes it the horizontal component of slope and takes what used to be the horizontal component, rotates it and makes it the vertical component. But what's important to notice, of course, is, is the negative reciprocal here. And I think it's easily justified that, well, one, one line is rising, one line has to be falling if it's rotated 90 degrees. So, so they'll certainly be opposite signed. Um, OK, well, just a quick um, <coughs> thought there. Okay, let's go ahead and try a few examples. Um, let's try this one. Um, let's let A be uh, the point negative 8, 4, B be 4, comma, negative 4, and C be 10, comma, 5. And let's try to classify the triangle ABC as right of 2 circuit and as either scalene, isosceles, or equilateral. And let's use an analytic approach, and then we'll check it using GeoGebra. <clears throat> uh, let's switch over to an overhead here. Um, I'll try to work this week on lined paper. Let's see how that goes. All right. Get myself organized here. All right, can you see? Yeah, we can see. All right. So what do we have? We have the point A, which is um, negative 8, comma, 4. We have the point B, which is... 4 comma negative 4 and we have the point C which is 10 comma 5 
Um, so let's just think about distances first. If we want to know whether this triangle is e equilateral, isosceles, or scalene, uh, we need to know the distance between each of these uh, three points. So I'm going to use um, Pythagoras and just say, well, AB squared must be, um, so the difference in uh, the absolute value of the difference in the x's, which is going to be negative 8 to 4, so that's 12 squared. Uh, 4 to negative 4 is going to be 8 squared, or excuse me, yeah, 8 squared, that's correct. Um, so what does that give us? That gives us that um, AB uh, squared has got to be 144 plus 64. So that means that AB squared has got to be uh, 208, which means that AB itself has to be the square root of 208. At this point, I would just leave it unsimplified. Um, Let's do the same so we know sort of a, a rough length here. Um, we're somewhere between, um, is it 13 and 14? I think 13 squared is, is 169, and 14 squared is greater than 208. I think I have that right. Um, but we're somewhere in that neck of the woods. Uh, let's see. So let's try um, BC squared. So B to C is going to be the difference in absolute value, the difference in the x's. So it looks like it's 6 squared. Uh, the difference in the y's, negative 4 and 5, are separated by a distance of 9, so that's 9 squared. So that means bc squared is going to be 36 plus 81. Um, that means that bc squared is going to be equal to 117, um, which means that bc itself is the square root of 117, certainly smaller than ab. Um, <coughs> So we're just under 11-ish in, in length on the calculator if we did an approximation. Um, let's try the last one, so CA. Um, I'll call it AC squared. So AC squared, the difference between 10 and negative 8 is 18. So the difference between 5 and 4 is just 1. Um, so what does that mean? It means that AC squared has to be equal to see, 18 squared is 324, and 1 squared is 1, so AC squared has to be equal to 325, and AC <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, uh, AC must be equal to the square root of 325. And so now we can do some comparisons here. Um, so right away, I know that um, since, let's see, what's the smallest BC? Since BC is strictly less than AB and AB is strictly less than AC, uh, triangle ABC is scalene. We do not have an isosceles nor an equilateral triangle here. It must be a scalene uh, triangle. OK, so now the question about right triangle arises. And here we could solve this a couple different ways. I mean, one thing we could do is use the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. So if we know um, we, we can use the converse to determine whether we've got a right, obtuse, or, or, um, or acute triangle, because for right, um, so let's just summarize that. Um, uh, if it's a right triangle, then what do we have? We have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, if we have acute triangle, well, what would have to be the case? So if, if it was acute, then a squared plus b squared, uh, this wouldn't be large enough to be right. So, um, so in other words, the c uh, would have to be smaller than equal to. So what would that mean? If c was too small um, to be right, then I believe we'd have this setting, right? So the sum of the two um, uh, legs squared would be greater than c squared. And if it was obtuse, um, then what would we have? We'd have a squared plus b squared um, less than c squared. So, so we could use this analysis to try to uh, compare um, what we have here. So, so now you have to decide which ones are legs and which ones are, you know, I guess, the longest side, the potential hypotenuse. So, so I can see that this one and this one are shorter than this one just by looking at their square roots. And um, so let's just take a look and see what a, a b squared plus 
uh, BC squared is, well, AB is 208, so 208 um, square root squared and 117 square root squared. Uh, that's equal to, well, 208 plus 117, which is equal to uh, 325, right? Um, which is also equal to, I guess, AC squared. Uh, so what can we say? So uh, since, what is it, AB squared plus BC squared is equal to AC squared, uh, we can conclude that triangle ABC is right. So uh, it looks like that guy is a right triangle um, that is scalene. Let's just take a look to verify, uh, at least pictorially, um, what we have. So I'm going to put a, tr a triangle on our plane, um, and then I'm going to position it where um, A is at negative 8, 4. Let's see. Um, negative 8, 4 seems right there. B is at... 4 comma negative 4, so B is right here, and C is at 10 comma 5, here's 10, 5, okay, so it does appear that this is a right angle, um, let's go ahead and measure the angle, just to be sure, indeed it does come up as a 90 degree angle, And um, one other thing that we could do is measure lengths. Um, I think there's a quick way you can do this for distance or length. If you click on each one of the sides with the distance tool, um, and I'll try to make this bigger so you can see it. There we go, something a little bit bigger to see. I can get rid of the perimeter, I don't need that. But here I can see that the hypotenuse is indeed different uh, in length than the two legs, uh, which are each given uh, here and here. And so indeed it is a scaling triangle with a right angle in the corner. And I'll go ahead and save this and post it um, to our page if you want to play around with it. Okay. Okay, well, so one example problem there involving the distance formula. Um, let's talk about another example problem here. Find the equation of a locus of points that are all four units away from the point 3, comma, negative 5, and let's use an analytic approach. Okay. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, a locus of points is just a collection of all points, right? Um, so a collection of points um, must have some equation, I guess, uh, associated with it. Um, the way we would do this is we would say, well, let's let x comma y um, be any point in the locus of points. Okay, um, so what are we talking about here? We're t let's you know, maybe sketch up a little picture. Um, um, we're, we're equidistant from 3 comma negative 5, right? 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 5. That's y, that's x, 3 comma negative 5. And we're trying to find every point. Um, sorry, let me just look and see. That are 4 units away from 3 comma negative 5. So f 4 units away from 3 comma negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, there would be one point. 1, 2, 3, 4, there would be another point. 
one, two, three, four, there would be another point, one, two, three, four, there would be another point, but of course, points along this arc should also satisfy, so what we really have here is a circle, right? We've been asked to find um, the equation of a circle, or the locus of points that are all four units, so something that looks sort of like that is what we're after, right? We want to know, you know, what's true, x comma y, about all those those points in that uh, in that figure. So if we let x y be any point, then we should be able to do this using the distance formula, right? Um, you know, if this is some point x comma y, right, and this is the point three comma negative five, then we know that that distance is always four here, right? So that means that according to the distance formula, which says that square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared uh, is, gives the distance. Here I could, I could use either of these points as my first and second point, uh, and we know the distance, which is 4. So, so that means we can derive an equation here by just saying that 4 must be equal to, let's see, the square root of, um, let's keep the x, um, y point to be the second point, so it'll just be x minus 3 squared plus y minus negative 5 squared. So what 4 is equal to the square root of uh, x minus 3 squared plus y plus 5 squared. I, I'm going to get rid of, of the squaring symbol uh, or the square root symbol by squaring both sides. So I get 16 equal to x minus 3 squared plus y plus 5 squared. So now we have a relationship that says, you know, given an x, uh, I can find a y um, that will, will satisfy the equation. And it's kind of important to notice that, you know, if I give you an x, um, th that the x must be, you know, in a certain domain in order for the y to be in a certain domain, um, you know, and be a point on the circle, it'd be interesting to ask, well, what happens if I give it an x of, you know, say, negative 6? But suffice it to say that what we have here now is a relationship between x and y that should allow us to solve um, for um, points on the circle. And this is the standard form for, uh, for uh, the equation of a circle. And to show you that it indeed um, is an analytic um, representation of a circle, let's take a look at what it looks like on GeoGebra. Um, one of the neat things about GeoGebra, um, let's start a new file. Um, Let's save that one, and let's save this one as, uh, let's say, circle. Um, and I'll move this a bit. Is uh, There is this input line down at the bottom where you can put analytic representations of any, uh, or equations for any objects, and it'll, it'll show you the graphical representation of it. So we think that we have the equation of the circle as, well, I'll write it just as we wrote it, 16 um, equals x minus 3 quantity squared um, and then plus uh, y plus 5 uh, quantity squared and sure enough there it is, uh, it shows us the circle, uh, it does appear to be centered at 3 comma negative 5 um, and it does appear to have a radius of 4. So kind of neat, analytically we can use the distance formula to find any equation of a circle. Um, it might be interesting to note that where this usually goes, um, at least in the study uh, in Algebra 1 or 2, is, is we try to generalize what's going on here. This, this of course, is, is that number 4 squared, so the radius squared. Um, 3 uh, is the location of the x location of the center, and negative 5 is the y location of the center. So there is, of course, a generalization of this that says this is r squared h and k here, where x minus h and y minus k, um, h comma k being the center of the circle.